It says recording is in progress. Okay, that's for the people who are not able to make it tonight, and then they may watch it after the fact. All right, so let's get started here. Slideshow from beginning. Okay, hi, my name is Kevin. This is Denver Through the Decades. I'm gonna put my contact information here in the window. Uh -huh. And it's also on one of the slides here. So if you have any questions after the fact, you may let me know. If you have any questions in the short term, you may type them into the chat window and we will get you all set. Okay, so Denver through the decades. I have to watch my clock here, so I make sure I don't run over. There I am. I bet you know by now where I am. Some of you have been watching this a lot. I'm in Dubuque. I will grow my hair. And since I'm growing my hair out, I'm gonna get a new picture. Okay, so doo -doo -doo. we are up to the 1940s now. So just a few things. By no means is this everything that happened in the 1940s in Denver or nearby but I just sort of chose some. I actually spoke with several of my colleagues prior to doing this presentation, and I said, wow, the 1940s, not a lot happened that's kind of noteworthy for Denver specifically. So obviously a lot of things happened in the 1940s. It's a whole decade, but sort of newsy, juicy things other than the war we kind of said, wow, the 40s is kind of a boring decade in some ways. It created some awesome people like my mom and my mother-in-law. But as far as jump out of your skin, kind of, hey, let me tell you this things, not so many. So that being said, I think we're going to have a very elegant and enjoyable jaunt tonight. Again, if you have any questions, let me know. So Denver and beyond. Obviously, the war, sort of the first half of our story tonight, a lot of what happened uh, wouldn't be anything that was sort of Denver specific. It was kind of the war. We did have no Olympic Games in 1940. Obviously, we were dealing with bigger issues. So at the state level, city level, first half of the decade, we're really just sort of focused on the war. Obviously, uh, um, Camp Amachi down in southeastern Colorado, that was a very Colorado specific thing. Um, we've already gone over that with the whole tour on the subject, so I didn't think I would jump on it much here today. Uh, 1942, Camp Hale came in. I hope you've all been there for a visit. It is a great visit if you haven't been, and there are plenty of books on the subject. Nearby, we had two cities incorporate Federal Heights. A lot of people don't even know that city exists. That city is most famous today for Waterworld. Cherry Hills Village incorporated in 1945. Cherry Hills Village did not want to become an airport. So that's one of the main reasons they um, incorporated so as to avoid Denver's plans of incorporating them to make them into an airport. This I was doing a lot of reading here and there and I thought this was just kind of fun. 1941, Jefferson County's first stoplight is installed, a sign of the future perhaps. 1946, a very well-known local figure, Mother Francis Xavier Cabrini was canonized, and you may go up to the Mother Cabrini Shrine and learn a little bit more about that. The Welcome Arch, I put a picture in here, that famous Welcome Arch in Golden, built 1949, and Denver's newest mountain park was dedicated uh, in the 1940s, Winter Park. So those are just some fun things that happened in the 1940s in and around Denver. So just a little bit of hay there. All right, we do this each presentation. Uh, I, I think not the 1860s and 70s, but most of the modern ones, we've looked at the development. So if you wish to look at previous presentations, those are all available online. You may go and have a gander at those, plenty of those. These maps were put out by a colleague of mine, Ken Treppel with Denver Urbanism. If you'd like to learn more about that, website and all of the wonderful things it has to say, go ahead and go to Denver Urbanism and give it a look. These maps were created by Ken. That guy has got amazing chops when it comes to computers. So this is the city and county of Denver. You see our neighborhoods there. 
In the 1930s, you see a whole lot of nothing going on in the extreme southwest, southeast, and northeast. The gray spots are where you've had development prior to the 1930s. In the 1930s, this red, these red dots are what was have been developed during that time. So you see we're developing Park Hill toward the east, hilltops getting its go. For those of you in the hilltop area, some beautiful houses, especially from the 1930s there. Uh, Westwood, we're starting to see more development over toward the southwest. In the College View neighborhood, which is over toward the southwest, it's the weird horseshoe looking one. Uh, my in-laws uh, moved into the area in da, 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 the 1940s. And here's where you see a whole lot of growth. Almost all of this growth would have been in the second half of the 1940s. We saw really little development during the first part. Of course, that's because of the war. Very few houses built because everything was going toward the war effort. You've probably seen signs for gathering tin and rubber and scrap paper and all of it. So almost all of this development, again, the 1940s. And as we'll talk about more next month, holy snot, the 1950s. Holy guacamole. We went bananas in the 50s. But tonight we're talking about the 40s. So let's look at the orgiastic expansion into the suburbs. Now that's gonna be a part of our theme to end on tonight. We are going to end with a little prognostication, uh, prediction for gloom and doom. The 1940s was kind of the last good decade for Denver for a while. Uh, the 40s really went well for us in many ways, but the 50s would see a dramatic downturn for the city's core. But we'll talk about that next month. In the 1950s, things would get great. But the 1940s, we held our breath basically for the first half of the decade. And the latter half of the decade, we did uh, go boom. We'll talk a little bit of that as we expand. All right. So some of the things from this decade, the Valley Highway. Now there is an entire PDF out there that talks about the history of the Valley Highway. Uh, there's another one that is was written in the 1940s. That's the paper that you see here on the right-hand side. In 1944, I thought I'd read out to you this little bit here. We have studied the location and construction of a north-south limited access highway extending through the city of Denver from the North City Line up at West 52nd and Ave uh, Avenue and Acoma down to University and Bucktail. This six lane divided road would be, will be adequate for all traffic requirements for many years to come. So this is what they thought at the time. So we were gonna build this highway the limited access means it's, going to, means it's going to have on and off ramps. So the way you think of an interstate today where you just don't drive up to it and turn right on, you have to make a determined decision to go. This project begun, uh, uh, the uh, study, excuse me, began in 1944. And then they did say, okay, great, let's do it. And the Colorado State Highway Division uh, they asked for this project and they signed off on it and it began there in 1944. The construction would complete in 1958. This project, hold on, there's my cursor. This project, as I said, would envision only certain points of access. So if you look to our left-hand side here, folks, that was it. That was the extent of the Valley Highway as it was originally intended in the city of Denver. And the study said we should follow the river. That's really the best course. Partly this was because they felt they would have the easiest time buying land there. The river was pretty blighted by this time. And a lot of the folks who lived along it were pretty poor. Uh, my mother-in-law talks about the kinds of houses that were along the South Platte River. And also there were uh, just areas that had already been left behind. So they felt this would be the easiest course to take. If you look there on the right-hand side, that is a fanciful rendering 
of what the valley highway would look like. I love that they've got the little floating clouds there. It just makes it look angelic. So this is what they said. This is what we're going to do. And in the end, they said yes. So this project was begun, and it was actually completed in 1958. So this project's completion would tie in to what immediately followed it, which was the Eisenhower era interstate system. So the Valley Highway was already in place. It was already there. So they began with 1925 using the road that we had already built. So we'll talk more about I-25 when we get to the 1950s, but this project did begin in the 1940s. Now, if any of you would like that PDF, uh, just shoot me an email, I'll send it off to you. It makes some kind of fascinating reading about what they thought this road would look like and how long it would actually serve. Seriously, they thought this was going to last us for decades without any problems. We weren't gonna have any traffic at all. And to be fair, corn, uh, corns, ooh, cars were not as ubiquitous at the time. We really didn't have as many of them. So perhaps they were correct in thinking that this uh, road that they had built would last for many decades. Now, of course, it's a bit laughable today, but there it is. So yeah, the Valley Highway. So we move on. In the late 1930s, uh, a number of people in the United States government felt that our ability to remain out of the World War, the Second World War, uh, was going to be uh, failed, or it was going to fail, that we were going to be drawn in regardless. So uh, in the early 1940s, we began implementing some things to prepare for what we believed would be the inevitable. Believe it or not, although I don't have any pictures for it, uh, a law was passed saying that any city in excess of 10,000 people could no longer have prostitution. So prostitution in Denver became illegal in 1941. So it was covert. It was sort of behind the scenes, but there was prostitution in Denver until that time. And <clears throat> as you know, there has been no prostitution in Denver since 1941. Another thing that we got at this time was the Denver Ordnance Plant. The, gov uh, the federal government purchased 2,040 acres from the Hayden family, which is a name you might recognize if you know the history of Green Valley, not Green Valley, I'm sorry, Green Mountain, uh, in 1940, December 1940, to build this plant. In late January 1941, the U.S. government signed a contract with Remington Arms to produce small arms ammunition. I wrote down some numbers here. At the height of production in 1943, the Denver Ordnance Plant was the fourth largest community in Colorado with a workforce of more than 22,000 people. They worked every hour of the day, day and night, producing over, get this, 6 million cartridges a day. Now over here on our right-hand side, that picture is a, uh, uh, what is the word? A, uh, you know, it's funny, I've totally forgotten the word. It's a place where you store things that are gonna blow up. So they put TNT and dynamite in there. That way, if they did end up blowing up, it wouldn't cause damage to the a bunker. There you go. Uh, in this case, it's a bunker to keep the things inside from harming those outside. So they're producing this bunker, this little repository for the TNT and the other things that might go kaboom. On the lower left-hand side there, you see many of the men who worked at this place. But here's a key piece. It was not just women. One of my grandmothers-in-law actually worked at the Denver Ordnance Plant, and that was her career. She ended up staying there for the rest of her life. She got this degree, uh, this job when she was a young woman and she stayed there. So it really kept her uh, whole career going. After the war was finished and production ceased, portions of the ordinance plant became offices, warehouse and laboratory space for other federal agencies. And it then became the Denver Federal Center, which is what most of you may know it as today. It was, um, I'm sorry, it is today a place where you may go to tour some facility functions 
You may go to the Denver Ice Core Laboratory, the Denver Federal Center Museum, the Bicentennial Park. You do, however, have to have ID. This is in Jefferson County. It is surrounded by Lakewood, but it is not part of Lakewood. Okay, so that's uh, early 1940s and really through the rest of the decade. Now, I didn't wanna talk about this part because I don't know anything about organized sports. But my colleague said, Kevin, just because you know nothing about organized sports doesn't mean you shouldn't talk about it. It's very important. So I was kind of hoodwinked or maybe strong armed into talking about this. So let's talk about baseball. As I understand it, organized sports, baseball, football, basketball, all those things actually bring a lot of money into our economy. People go downtown not only to watch the games, but they go to drink and eat and do all these things before and after the games. And that really does bring a lot of money into the city. So with that in mind, let's talk a little, a little history. Now, I don't know any of this stuff, so I have made some notes because I'm not a sports ball person. In Denver, oh, sorry, I have to let in someone. There you go. In Denver, there were many sites for baseball games Founding uh, After the founding of the town, folks used to play here and there and everywhere. There was a previous park, Merchants Park. And in 1947, they decided we would build a new stadium, Bears Stadium. Merchants Park had been the host to lots of things, barnstorming, uh, numerous tournaments, as well as games with the Bears. But in the end, a family came in and they bought the team and they said, we need more seating. So what they did is decide to build a new stadium up near 20th and Clay, just north of Colfax, just west of Federal. The Bears were a minor league affiliate of 12 different teams and saw, and I'm just reading this part out because I don't know any of these people, saw a continual parade of soon to be stars like Tony Kubik, Bobby Richardson, Don Larson, Marv Throneberry, Gates Brown, Tim Raines, Jake Wood, Andre Dawson, Mikey Lolich, and on and on and on. The opening game was at the stadium in 1948 between the Denver Bears and the Sioux City Sioux. 16,000 seats in the stadium, a crowd of about 11,000 people. So here you have the stadium. And eventually, hold on they would do an expansion on it. So nothing of this stadium still stands today. They got additional seating in the 50s and in the 60s. Eventually, this would be renamed Mile High Stadium. It served as the football and baseball stadium for Denver until Major League Baseball arrived. The first two seasons of the Colorado Rockies baseball were played at Mile High Stadium this original one, but a player strike in mid-season 1994 meant that the last baseball game for the Mile High Stadium uh, just didn't take place there. So today, of course, our original Mile High Stadium, our original Bears Stadium, as it was called, uh, no longer stands. They did demolish it, but it was constructed there in the 1940s. Okay, as part of the preparation for the war effort, Another thing that was created in the 1940s would have been the establishment of the Rocky Mountain Arsenal in 1942. It was called the Arsenal of Democracy. And this is the sort of place where they had to make all those things uh, that we need in order to conduct the war. So I wrote down some numbers because sometimes numbers are great. 17,000 acre site, they produced mustard gas, lewisite, chlorine gas, and incendiary weapons. By the end of that very first year of production, 1943, our capacity of production in the United States has incre had increased more than 150%. The arsenal also housed prisoners of war. After the war, it went to a standby status. They reactivated during the Korean War. And then over time, they moved into producing other things, uh, shell chemical, et cetera. They produced through 1982. 
Many of the byproducts would have been injected into deep wells in the ground, 12,000 feet below the surface. Um, after the Vietnam conflict, they demilitarized the Rocky Mountain Arsenal. And by the 1980s, it ceased production. And then it just sort of sat there and was toxic, I guessed. So they really didn't do much with it until finally, in the 1980s, they decided to remediate the site. It became a Superfund site, which meant that it had to be cleaned. Almost the whole place was one giant toxin. So almost everything that was there was later buried. They didn't recycle it, they didn't reuse it, they just buried it because it was so toxic. So that Superfund uh, Act, did end up uh, continuing for many years. Finally, in 1992, Congress decided that it would become the Rocky Mountain Arsenal National Wildlife Refuge. It opened in the 1990s, and today we get to enjoy it. They have bison there and black-footed ferrets and all that. So even though the story of the Rocky Mountain Arsenal does cover many decades, it did begin there in the 1940s as part of our war effort. Denver had a lot of contribution to the war effort. Uh, so this is one of the stories that I thought we'd talk about along with the Federal Center, the Ordnance Center as was. So this beautiful picture, if you haven't been out for a program at the Rocky Mountain Arsenal, the National Wildlife Refuge, please go. I think you'd enjoy it. Okay, I recently took a tour uh, with Dr. Gulliford, Andy Gulliford, uh, from Fort Lewis College in Durango, and he had a lot to say about this guy right here. Um, I did know about him, but I will say I had not really fully appreciated uh, Wayne Aspinall. So having taken that tour with Andy, I have to say uh, I'm in the process of learning more about uh, Congressman Aspinall. Uh, there's a book out there that you may read, The Politics of Western Water, and there is a picture of him here on the left-hand side. This is a fellow that you kind of love or you hate. It's kind of no middle ground with him. And the reason for that is he really ended up guiding the idea of water usage in the Western United States, especially in Colorado, for decades. His family moved from Ohio to Colorado when he was just about four years old. He graduated here after serving in the war. He came back. He ran for Congress. And in 1948, Wayne Aspinall was uh, chosen to, the, to join the House of Representatives in Washington, D.C. He served from 1948 until 1973 as chair of the Committee on Irrigation and Reclamation, he was able to guide how we dealt with projects in the West, especially concerning water. I'm just gonna read out this quote uh, from the book there. As chair, Aspinall shaped and influenced legislation directly benefiting the American West in general and his fourth congressional district in particular. This is Western Colorado. All mining, public land reclamation, and Native American legislation had to pass through his committee. He played a direct role in shaping monuments such as uh, the Colorado, I'm sorry, as such as the Flaming Gorge, Curicanti, Navajo, and Glen Canyon dams and reservoirs, the Wilderness Act of 1964, and numerous uh, water retention acts. So in the end, this guy, he was one of those ones that you, oh, I'm sorry, I'm too early. One of those ones that you had to get on your side or nothing was going to get done. In the late 1960s, he started running afoul of the environmental mu movement. A lot of folks thought he was a problem. The Sierra Club said, quote, many an environmental dream has been dashed on the stony continent that is Wayne Aspinall. In the end, environmental movements in the West, efforts to remove him from office would succeed 
and he would not regain his seat during the election in 1942. There was a gentleman uh, who pushed for more environmental consciousness, and Mr. Aspinall was not reelected. So that is more than 25 years of shaping water in the West. So if you don't know about him, his election in 1948, you should look into it. Definitely a big figure in our state's history. And even though that does not, or excuse me, that did not specifically happen in Denver, uh, his work affected the state as a whole, including Denver. So I thought I would include him in there. So you know from having watched these presentations before that I love anything to do with water. It is a subject very dear to my heart, how we manage or mismanage water. Uh, in the 1930s, I really had a lot to say. The projects of the 1930s continued. We didn't really start many new projects in Denver in the 1940s, but for one, in 1946, Denver Water began construction on the Blue River Tunnel later named the Harold Roberts Tunnel, to carry water under the Continental Divide from the Dillon Reservoir to the South Platte River. It took 16 years to complete. The tunnel bore 4,465 feet below the surface. The tunnel itself is 23 miles long. This was a huge construction project. It took years, but in the end, this is part of that water diversion from the western slope where 80% of the water is to the eastern slope where 80% of the people are. So for those folks on the western slope, it was kind of too bad, so sad, you're gonna lose the water because Denver was where the power was. All right, we continue. Now, in speaking with my colleagues, one of the things that we decided to mention for the 1940s is that it was kind of the last, actually I shouldn't say kind of, it was the last decade where the city looked Victorian. If you look here on the right-hand side, you have the Brown Palace Hotel. Looking down 17th Street here toward Union Station, you see that none of the buildings are higher than 10, 12 stories. The buildings are of brick or stone and the elevation has its limit. You can see the cars, the street cars, all those things. We are still really a Victorian city. It would be our last decade looking like that. We were still attached to the past. The 1950s, all that's gonna be thrown to the window, uh, thrown out the window, excuse me. So the 1940s, even though I don't really have any buildings I wanna focus on from the 1940s, just the general flavor of the 40s is still attached to the past, kind of fun. The 1950s, holy snot, we have a lot to say. Okay, now another thing that would happen in the 1940s was the beginning of annexation. For those of you who remember our presentation from the 19 aughts, we talked about how that was the last time until the 1940s that Denver would annex land. We had the formation of the city and county of Denver in 1902, and we absorbed some cities around us that had gone basically belly up, and that was it. We retained those boundaries for about 40 years. But in the 1940s, especially after the war, we began a series of annexations, really aggressive annexations in the 90s and 1950s and 60s that would earn us the enmity of many of the people around us. So the 1940s begins that march outward. So I wanted to uh, read to you a little bit of a quote here. I realize some of you can read it, but I know some of you uh, don't necessarily read well or can't see it or you're just listening. So Garden Platt, or Garden Park, excuse me, was platted in 1943, northwest of West Jewel and South Zunai. I'm excuse me, yes, northwest of Jewel and Zunai in southwestern Denver. The development featured large lots limited by the following covenants and restrictions. Not more than one single family dwelling on a tract. Restricted placement on lot. No animal housing or corrals. No noxious or offensive trade or activity. No trailer, wagon, basement, 
tent, mobile structure of any kind could be used as a residence, only a permanent building. The area became part of Denver as part of the Davis Ranch annexation. Numerous annexations in the 40s took place. Davis Ranch, uh, the Brentwood annexation in 1946, Westwood annexation in 1948, and you can see that there as a neighborhood. This was a watershed moment in our state's history. Notice these restrictions. Previously, you can, you could, oh, sorry, hold on. Do, 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 do. There we go. Previously, you could really do anything that you wanted. If you wanted to live in a chicken coop, you could. My mother-in-law uh, described how once upon a time in the College U neighborhood, things were kind of loosey-goosey. Uh, my mother, my grandmother-in-law said the same thing. But in the 1930s, we're moving, moving toward hard and fast zoning regulations so that we know what houses deserve federal aid and which ones do not. These would be codified in the 1940s, and our new developments in the 1940s said those freewheeling ways of the past no longer going to be allowed. So this really came push to shove in the southwestern neighborhoods. Look, you see Athmar Park, Westwood, Marley, Ruby Hill, Harvey Park, all those areas. As they're being brought into the city, we are enforcing this idea of how you may build. And that all began in the 1940s. So folks, right now, you and I are watching as the city struggles with the consequences of those decisions made in the 1940s, having only a single family home uh, on the lot, not being able to have accessory dwelling units, not being able to have unmarried, unrelated people in a house. These are laws that would be passed in the 1940s that we are struggling with today as we seek to have affordable housing in the city or to come up with ways to make Denver accessible to all people. So the 1940s, this is when this all begins. So we're gonna talk more about that in later decades. So Charles Betcher, this is a name I could have talked about over many, many decades, but he actually dies in 1948. So I thought I would place him in this decade. Here he is on the right with that amazing, I would never want to have one like that mustache. I honestly don't ha know how anyone survives with a mustache like that. It must get in your food constantly. His residence in Denver is limited to only one. That's today's gubernatorial residence. The one that you see there on the left-hand side is on the top of Lookout Mountain. Charles Betcher, this is one of those guys who came uh, west, and he left Germany, came west, and he ended up being very smart, very hardworking, and he became fantabulously wealthy. Uh, he and his children came out here. Claude would be the one who would continue the Betcher name in Denver. Uh, he did lots of amazing things. He built beautiful buildings, but I think the thing he is most famous for is his Great Western Sugar Company. People know the sugar beet industry made a lot of the West. Cities like Longmont, Fort Collins, Loveland grew up and grew rich on sugar beets. Charles Betcher is generally credited with beginning that industry in Colorado. Even though we do know people were growing sugar beets in Colorado as early as the 1860s, for whatever reason, those never took off. So we have Charles Betcher to thank for this this luminary, this giant of industry in Colorado, dead, and, uh, dead in 1948. One of the other things that he did, which I think is kind of interesting, is of course, being a very wealthy guy, he donated lots of money. Don't try to go see this wonderful school, it got demolished. And this is, the, the story of this demolishing is why I don't like Children's Hospital. This was originally the Betcher School for Crippled Children, opened in 1940. Architect Burnham Hoyt, uh, Charles Betcher gave a lot of money to open this school. It was the very first school designed for children with different physical needs. So it had ramps, it had banisters, uh, to, basically to make sure that these kids with special needs were gonna be okay. Now in the 1940s, it was really innovative. It was one of our first uh, schools really built with that modern aesthetic. 
So there aren't a lot of pictures out there. Uh, this picture really shows that wonderful concrete, um, very, uh, what's the word? Uh, Art modern meets modern uh, eclectic style there. So when this went up in 1940, it was very much admired. They had an addition built onto the school in 1955. It used to be at 1900 Downing. Uh, the one story, I wrote down some details here from the newspaper. This fine one story building has a concrete frame, walls made of pre-cast concrete panels and aluminum casement windows. There is a port cocher surrounded by round concrete columns. Um, folks didn't quite know what to make of this building when it went up, but in the end, a lot of folks liked it. They said, this is gonna be the face of the future. Unfortunately, later on, Children's Hospital wanted to build, and they said, we will not build in Denver uh, unless you demolish this school so that we can rewrite, uh, reroute Downing. So in the end, we tore down this beautiful one-of-a-kind school so that we could reroute Downing to please Children's Hospital. In the end, Children's Hospital uh, said, and they left us for uh, Aurora. So I'm not a fan of Children's Hospital because we lost this beautiful school. And in the end, Downing was straightened out again. We didn't even have to do it. So there you go, poo-poo on Children's Hospital. Okay. This is a story a lot of you maybe have heard on other presentations or other tours. The tradition of holiday lighting, believe it or not, actually began here in Denver. It began back in the 19 teens, but in the 1940s, we were so enthusiastic with our holiday lighting that we were dubbed the Christmas capital of the world. That's right, in 1945, baby, NBC came to Denver and broadcast a tribute to Denver's having created the tradition of exterior lighting, dubbing us, the city of Denver, the Christmas capital of the world. And let me just tell you, we were out of our minds. As one person said, if it wasn't moving, we decorated it. So I have a couple of pictures from that time period. So this is Curtis Street in downtown Denver. Here you have the lighting ceremony in Civic Center Park. And even though this picture, this, I'm sorry, this series of pictures is from 1920, it does show you the degree of exuberance uh, that we, we loved here in Denver. We loved it, gaudy, tacky, over the top. It really didn't matter. If you were willing to do it, we were going to love it. So in 1945, ladies and gentlemen, it's official. We became the Christmas capital of the world. Now today, of course, Christmas lights are all over the place. The city, of county build, city and county building has them, yes, but most people don't realize that it all got started here in Denver. So if you haven't learned about Mr. Sturgeon, uh, an electrician and his uh, work with that, we're probably going to do a Delights of the Season tour in December. That's where I tell the full story. So I don't want to steal thunder from that one. All right. The Christmas capital of the world. Yay, Denver. I love us. We are amazing. Okay. Now, this is a story that really comes to fruition later in the 1950s. But I do want to note that in the 1940s, Bob Stanley served as a pilot and test pilot during World War II. This would be his training for what was to come. He flew, and I don't know what this is, but the XP-59A, America's first jet-powered aircraft, flying it for the first time on October 1st, 1942. Bob Stanley, test pilot in the war, Later on, of course, I bet you can guess what he would end up becoming. That's right. When he moved back to Denver, he would found Stanley Aviation. We're going to talk more about that next month. But for now, I did want to say in the 1940s, that's where he got his training in being a pilot. Speaking of pilots, 
There was an unhappy moment in the 1940s that did happen with planes. This is the sort of picture you don't want to imagine. On September 26th, 1943, a four-engine B-24 Liberator bomber crashed in a residential section in South Denver, killing all seven airmen aboard. I'm sorry, killing at least seven airmen on board. The aircraft was based at Lowry Field. It struck a wooden garage, it struck a wooden garage adjacent to a wide vacant lot and scorched some nearby homes. One of the eyewitnesses said, and I quote, when it was directly overhead, the pilot must have noticed the vacant lot because it looked to me as if he was trying to pancake a landing. It all happened within a split second. The plane crashed and exploded. A sheet of flame shot up about 60 feet and seemed to fall over the houses. The heat was so intense that you could not get close. I noticed wreckage flying through the air over the front of the plane within a split second after the crash. So this is one of those moments that's uh, definitely very sad. Another moment that was definitely very sad in this uh, time period, as I went looking through some of the other things that happened in the 1940s, uh, a very sad moment at Elitch Gardens. Now, of course, you know that Elitch's was an amusement park. Earlier, when it was founded, it was a zoological and botanical gardens. Well, by the 1940s, they did have some other rides in there, including one that Mary Elitch would never have approved of, the Tunnel of Love. I really couldn't find a lot of good pictures of this event. Uh, the pictures that you have here are really the best I could find. So if you look at the upper left-hand corner, that was the gate that stood uh, at the corner of 38th and Tennyson until the 1950s when they would put up that very modern gate. So the Tunnel of Love was one of those places where you would go have a ride with your honey bunny as you saw the various uh, scenes along its length. July 16th, 1944, quote, a fire swept through the darkened tunnel of love at Elitch Gardens Amusement Park. Uh, the newspaper reported that six people died. What was inside, they had all of these scenes, uh, painted scenes that recreated uh, places you might visit around the world. The scenes were painted with oil on canvas made of wood, so really there was a lot in there that was flammable. Among the dead were uh, four soldiers and their wives and some park employees who tried to help everyone escape. So the Tunnel of Love there at Elitch's, very sad moment in our amusement park history in Denver. Uh, fires at amusement parks, absolutely nothing new. Okay, the next thing I wanna talk about is what uh, the 1940s ended up becoming. It was the beginning of a hemorrhage in the Denver housing markets history. So this is actually something that one of my colleagues, Tom Noel, uh, Dr. Colorado himself has written a lot about. There are numerous works out there that talk about it, not just Tom's, but other people's as well. So it's a subject you may explore mo more fully if you want. The upper left-hand side there, you see the Dunning Benedict Mansion at 12th in Pennsylvania. The upper right-hand side, you see the erroneously named Molly Brown House Museum at 1344, I believe it is, Pennsylvania. And down below, you see a sign of what was to come. So after the war, a lot of people returned. Uh, the population from 1940 to 1950 grew almost 29%. A lot of that growth uh, was from folks who had been here during the war training, and they really liked it. They'd been at Lowry or Buckley, uh, Fort Logan, wherever it might be, and they said, wow, this place is kind of nice. So as Tom says, a lot of folks fell in love with the sunshine and the climate. So what we had is a lot of GIs coming, newcomers flooding college campuses as part of the GI Bill, and then their children 
their baby boomer uh, children flooded the schools. During World War II, Lowry had more than 50, 57,000 people pass through it. And that, that doesn't count all the people who worked at the Remington Arms, out at the Federal Center, up at the Rocky Mountain Arsenal. We had a lot of folks here temporarily. Many of them stayed, others returned. So as one, uh, as Tom Noel said, one quote here, the 1940s, quote, was the greatest growth since the 1980s. Before that, the city had just grown 30 or 40,000 people. It was the first big boom since the 80s. The 1940s saw it begin and the 1950s would saw it grow even more. But the difference was much of that growth would go to the suburbs. So that's very important here. Uh, going on with what Tom said, many of the jobs, the defense industry jobs would not disappear. Lowry stayed open. The munitions plants were taken over by federal agencies after the war. It was a time when people, after three or four years, could come back and say, well, now what do I do? They could start all over again, and they could start a new life here. Mayor Quig Newton said, the war was a very dislocating situation. Many people were uprooted after the war. They had no place to go. They didn't want to go home to their previous lives. And so they saw Denver as a place to make a new beginning. There was a real shortage of everything. So there were no houses built during the war. So we built a lot here. So what ends up happening is the mansions that you see here, the Molly Brown House Museum as it is today, the Dunning Benedict Mansion, these would be chopped into apartments or very importantly, they would be torn down to make high-rise apartments, such as you see here in the lower central picture. So we began to lose our history. I mean, it was a giant flood of destruction. Either the mansions were lost or they were chopped to make apartments. Margaret Brown's house became apartments. Many of the giant mansions in Capitol Hill that we still have today are apartments from this time period. So it would really be uh, something that set up what was to come in the 1950s. So before we move into questions, I do wanna make just a couple of announcements. I apologize for those of you who have already heard it before, but I do wanna make sure we say it. Save the date, folks. Next year's brochure, our treasure map, comes out at our event, setting the course on Friday, November 18th. We have an in-person event on the Aurelia campus. For those of you who don't want to attend, you may attend remotely. It is also going to be online, but we prefer you come in person because we're going to have cookies and hot chocolate and all that. Ladies and gentlemen, our first big tours for next year are live. They're out. The National Parks of South Florida, January 9th to 17th and winter in Yellowstone, January 25th to February 1st. These are all out. I've done both of them, uh, either as a tour, the Yellowstone tour I've done, it's amazing. I have researched all the parks in South Florida. I went and did them all. The two pictures that you see on the right-hand side, I took those pictures. The two pictures there on the left-hand side, my colleague Michael took. Ladies and gentlemen, please join us for our event on November 18th. Please tell everyone uh, we are not yet certain we're going to survive the coming year, so please spread the word and join us on November 18th. So that being said, we move on to questions. This picture is a photo postcard I found of Denver in the 1940s. You can see we are starting to move to buses. That yellow bus there is replacing the streetcars. We began, as I mentioned from the 1920s presentation, we began moving from buses to street, uh, excuse me, from streetcars uh, to buses in the 1920s, the 1940s that gets going in earnest. So ladies and gentlemen, I apologize if I have not hit something that uh, you really would like to learn about. Could you put something in the chat about the events? So hmm, is that about November 18th? So November 18th from six to eight, uh, that is where we're going to have our setting the course for next year. So November 18th from 6 to 8, it's going to be on the Auraria campus at 1190 Auraria Parkway, which is the Spring Hill Suites. 
Okay. So if you have any other questions, please shout out into the chat window here. If you have any uh, questions, you're welcome to call me or email me after the event or excuse me, after our presentation. I really don't mind. Just let me know and we'll get you all set. Ooh, look at how dark I am there. Okay. I didn't realize the sun had set and I'm in darkness. Uh, thank you for joining tonight. If you don't have any questions, I hope you have a great dinner. I'll see you again in a month for the 1950s. It's going to be an epic presentation because there is a lot to say. So I will watch for questions. Again, thank you so much for joining and happy autumn, my favorite season. <laughs> Hi, John. Hi, Ann. <laughs> All righty. I don't see any other questions coming in. So, folks, thank you so much. I'm going to stop the recording and I'll see you again very soon.